Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, welcome to our event on online learning during COVID. I'm Maddie Sheher um, from the Staff Student Solidarity Network. We're a group of staff and students at Edinburgh Uni working around shared struggles and the commodification of education. We've organised this event to hear from different speakers and share our own experiences of online learning. Since the pandemic began, we've become increasingly aware of the ways in which edtech and online platforms are profiting from the crisis and are also enabled by universities. While the pandemic may be temporary, it's clear that outsourced private tech companies have an interest in integrating themselves into our universities and into our learning experience. In a higher education context, which is driven by profit, we need to recognise the ways in which staff and students are impacted by this. The profitability of student data also blurs the distinction between workers and students. And as we'll hear about later, this is an opportunity for solidarity. Although this pandemic creates new opportunities for profit from online learning companies, it also leads to new ways of building solidarity, as both staff and students recognise how our education is increasingly becoming a vehicle for profit making. I'm now going to hand over to Dan Kay, who is also from the Staff Student Solidarity Network. Hi, thanks Maddie. Uh, yeah, I'm Dan Kay, I'm a fourth year member of the Solidarity Network, uh, he, him. So I just want to briefly speak about one of the intentions um, of having this meeting at all, which is obviously primarily, as Maddie said, it's just to get a better, better sense of the way in which work for both, you know, work, formal workers within the university and students themselves are basically our experience has been radically shifted by the introduction of educational technologies, the major sh digital shift we've under everything's undergone due to the closing of, well, not the closing of the campus, but at least the major shift of things off campus. And this links quite well with a lot of the things that we've at least been attempting to do at the Star Student Solidarity Network, perhaps over the last year, where one of our interests has been in this, um, the notion of the workers inquiry, which is a uh, militant political tool, organisational tool, in which um, workers within their own workplaces can build up a better sense of how their workplace, how their labour is um, reproduced. So it's a tool which really stems uh, uh, over a century. It's a kind of, often it's kind of referred to as a sociology from below, the idea that we don't need kind of external uh, academics often to come and inform us about our work, but rather what we need to do is as workers ourselves and perhaps students ourselves, this is one of the interesting inquiry, is to better think about um, the way in which struggle is always unfolding in a workplace, the way in which the temporality of the workplace is shaped, the way in which technologies are being imposed and resisted within a workplace to ensure kind of regularized and stable uh, extraction of value, the way in which a workplace shifts over time, the different compositions of a workplace, that kind of the outside of the workplace, the unpaid and the paid labor, the unrecognized and the recognized forms of labor. It's a way of reckon, um, a form of inquiry by workers themselves to kind of better get a better clarification of what they're actually up to when they're doing their work. How does how is it different from that what they're formally being told that they're actually being employed to do that they're being paid for? So a workers inquiry is a kind of radical investigation into the nature of work by the workers themselves. Obviously, this isn't just because it's an interesting thing to do. It's not just demystifying what we're told we're doing. It's because it has a radical political consequence, which is it can inform us the better ways we can be politically organizing. Well, it you know, informs us in the ways in which actually, you know, there's potential unity between these different forms of work across a, a work site, across a university. There's different forms of solidarity and struggle. There's forms of struggle we, we haven't thought about before, which we could actually organize around. There's whole waves of issues that no one's really considered. They haven't been seen as appropriate things for workers to struggle on. But now, you know, we recognize their shared issues, which workers have. And obviously within the context of um, the COVID shift to online teaching, which is totally new for students and workers alike, academics and non-academics. And so much of it's kind of been radically, you know, immediately imposed upon workers with very little of their kind of consent or in kind of cons consultation by university administration. So we need a better sense of what work is actually being done across the university. Because obviously everyone to a degree knows the work they're doing, but by mapping it all together as a group of comrades with the political intent that we can learn things from studying work from below, we can actually come to organize collectively not just within you know as students as workers as well we can we really need to think about how collectively we're reproducing the university one of the kind of primary political intentions of the solidarity network as, as it has existed is to just not think about students and workers as these 
parallel but nonetheless distinct things but the way in which it's only through their kind of collective activity together we reproduce the university and all of this re reproduction of the university has obviously shifted in COVID to new sites new platforms new technologies so we kind of want to have this meeting so we can inquire into this new terrain of work this new composition of work um i'll leave it there and i think the plan now i think i'll pass to sophia to explain what's happening next Um, okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Sophia and I am a member of staff at the Edinburgh College of Art and also a member of the Staff Student Solidarity Network. So our plan for the next step um, is to, to divide us in small groups and to go through the questions that I put in the chat. Um, why Dante uh, was speaking? Um, I suggest we divide this group into three groups because we are, I think anything else would be, um, and I just want to uh, see, uh, I need three people who will make notes, yeah, from what is going to be discussed so that we can connect, uh, we can put uh, the notes after the end of the conversation um, on a Google document so that we can see uh, what other people uh, discussed. So Sophia um, will make notes in one group. Um, Dante, can you make some notes in, an, in another group? Um, and who wants to make notes in the third group? Can I have a volunteer, please? Connie, thank you. Okay, all right. So I will stop the recording now and invite the group. Uh, Okay, so we will continue after having done all this discussion in the um, uh, groups. Um, we will now continue with the second half um, of this uh, event. Um, and we will continue with our speaker, uh, Mercedes Horner. And um, I would like to ask Sophia Woodman to introduce briefly Mercedes. Can you please, Sophia? do that thank you okay so i'm so happy mercedes is coming again to participate in an event that um i'm helping organize a few weeks ago we put on an event on um academic freedom in the university online and mercedes talked about this issue and um about around student um uh capture of student data and consent um, and uh, she did such a great job and got complimented on we thought oh well you know maybe Mercedes is the teacher of the future rather than me definitely <laughs> and uh, um, uh, so I I found out about Mercedes because I read her MSc dissertation and I thought it was really fabulous so I after the all the marking process was over i got in touch with her because i thought people need to know about um the research she did because not i mean a lot of the the writing about the ed tech um field really concentrates it from on it from a, um the point of view of academic staff and and there's really very little from the student uh, uh, academic staff universities and what they're doing and the whole ed tech business sector. But the student is kind of missing. Um, and what what and, and so Mercedes is going to tell us something about, you know, what 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 are they um, what are they up to um, in relation to students and what should students be concerned about? So thank you for being here. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so I'm going to share my slides. Can you see? Good. Okay. So today I will be discussing my dissertation topic, which is student consent to data capture and surveillance, um, which basically examines data mining practices in UK higher education. 
And so I want to begin by first introducing the concept of fluid data. Now, this data is left behind by students as they interact with their university through online systems and on campus technologies. And a lot of fluid data comes through student interaction with ed tech, like learning management systems. And these are things like Blackboard, Moodle, and Canvas. And they collect data like how many times a student opens a syllabus or an assigned reading. Um, they can monitor, monitor interactions with digital texts, like if students are making notes, how quickly they're reading. Uh, some systems can even track eye movements to see if students are skimming or rereading certain passages. And the same can be said for accessing lecture videos and audio files. So how many times you watch, if you fast forward or rewind, at what point you close the file. And some systems can also even monitor how long it takes to finish an assignment, even if it's un timed. And pre-pandemic physical data that was collected on campus included things like swiping into different buildings, logging how many times a student visited the library or took out a book, and predicting what days and times they were most likely to be on campus. So these are just a few of the many different examples that constitute fluid data, ultimately building a student's digital footprint. And the reason that this is so valuable is not necessarily because of the data itself, but because of the learning analytics that are employed on it and what they can reveal from the data. And so the Higher Education Policy Institute described learning analytics as correlating this fluid data with learning outcomes in order to optimize the learning experience. So analytics can do things like predict retention rates, flag students who seem like they might be at risk of underperforming, and even predict within the first year if a student will not graduate on time. And these analyses are solely based on students' daily and often required interactions with ed tech. So as you can imagine, over the course of their career, students will generate thousands of data points on their academic life, their learning habits, and behaviors whilst at university. So these analytics and the data that they require are really important because they've become basically an unavoidable feature of the UK higher ed experience. And this is not by accident. Uh, this was actually a conscious policy reform made by the now disbanded Department of Business, Innovation and Skills. And they were the first to identify English education, higher education as data rich uh, and encouraged that the learning analytics should be introduced into universities. And so one of their more famous reforms was introducing the data set called LEO, and that stands for Longitudinal Educational Outcomes. And this ultimately linked student and tax data together to track their journey from school through higher education and into a career. And this basically normalized the idea of thinking about education quality through potential graduate earnings rather than attending university for more traditional pedagogic pursuits. And their report was supposed to, quote, put choice for students at the heart of its reform strategy. But there was really no mention of any data rights or discussion of what would happen should a, choose, should a student choose not to participate in analytics or in the LEO data set. So this is really important because these reforms basically emphasize the student the value of student data. And they justified this through public interest, arguing that uh, future students could use this data to make more informed decisions about where they want to attend university, which would in turn make the application process more competitive and help marketize the sector while also appeasing to taxpayers who have a vested interest in uh, higher education and the economy. And so restructuring higher ed in this way to prioritize student data has resulted in an expanding marketplace and a booming ed tech sector. And an important figure here is JISC, which is the UK's higher ed technology and digital solutions expert member organization. And they're responsible for things like Edo Roam, uh, the Wi-Fi infrastructure, along with the .ac.uk domains, and they offer extensive learning analytics. So JISC has considerable influence and buying power when it comes to ed tech, and they've stated multiple times that they hope to single-handedly develop the UK into a powerhouse of ed tech by providing third sector access for emerging technologies. In their 2019 Horizons report, which identified what they're investing in, what they're researching, and some predictions they have for the future, they stated that within the next five years, it's possible, quote, there will be a data flow from day one in school to university with a significant number of data points around the individual educational journey of a student in order to identify outlier behavior and raise a digital flag tracked from preschool to postgrad. 
So while we're not quite there yet, it's really not a stretch to see how this is feasible within the near future. And this report uh, focused a lot on the future of incorporating mental health into the learning analytics. So the digital flags that they talk about, although they don't provide any examples of what these might be, uh, they would be identified through their analytics system and the use of fluid data in order to help pinpoint early warning signs of mental health concerns that might provoke academic failure, uh, thus allowing for a timely response or interventions made by the university. And this is part of their growing interest in researching and developing mental health analytics as part of their broader learning analytics packages, ultimately used to optimize the student learning experience. And so we can see just how far reaching learning analytics have the potential to go in this attempt to perfect education and what it means to learn in the 21st century. So the questions that I was interested in is where does this leave the student? Specifically, can students opt, opt out of these learning analytics or withhold their consent from data processing? And is it even possible to attend university today without participating in this vast collection and analysis of fluid data? So in an attempt to answer this question, um, I turned to the strong legal framework for data protection in the UK and the EU, which is the GDPR. And the GDPR defined consent as any freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous indication of an individual's agreement to having their data processed. So the GDPR does allow individuals to withdraw their consent at any time, unless the data is necessary for statistical purposes, reasons of public interest, performance of a contract, or performance of an official authority vested in the controller. And so statistical purposes and public interest were especially highlighted in the higher ed reforms to justify collecting and processing student data. And entering a contract with a university simply by deciding to study there is essentially consenting to any and all future data capture as it's becoming an embedded element of the educational experience. Interestingly, the UK's Information Commissioner's Office, or the ICO, which is an independent body responsible for upholding information rights and data privacy for individuals, they published guidance for universities on how to approach consent for data capture within this GDPR legal framework. And they say that, quote, the GDPR sets a high standard for consent, but you often won't need consent. Um, and this is because they find that consent is inappropriate if institutions would still process personal data on a different lawful basis, even if consent were refused or withdrawn. So it's clear that if students want to pursue a degree, they really have no consent or choice when it comes to this vast amount of data collection and processing. Even if there were a loophole around this, the GDPR also protects data processing if it's necessary for the purposes of legitimate interests pursued by the controller or by a third party. And so the ICO reasserts under legitimate interests, you can process almost all personal data without consent. So here's an example uh, from Edinburgh that re reiterates this language from the GDPR in their privacy statement on how they process student data. They confirm the fluid data that they're collecting, which is including use of services, facilities, lecture capture, attendance and engagement monitoring. Uh, along with some other things. And for the legal basis, they utilize language like consent for special category data, which is things like religion, political affiliation, or race, uh, performance of a student contract, legal obligation to the UKVI, which is uh, an extension of the home office that uh, gives tier four visas to international students, and also HESA, which is the statistical agency for higher ed. They also use language like vital interest, public interest, legitimate interest to the university or a third party, and automated decision making. So I would argue that all of this type of data collection um, and analysis of fluid data is using the term data valence, and it exemplifies data valence. And that is basically the process of monitoring and processing vast amounts of data on people, typically without their awareness. And this is also an example of soft surveillance, which is a less invasive way to collect information. Um, and usually soft data collection tactics give the impression of volunteering data rather than having it seized. So for students using learning analytics, um, it's supposed to be in their best interest because they're supposed to help them, help them optimize their time at university, but they don't actually have a choice to say, no, I don't actually wanna participate in this. They basically have to accept that learning analytics um, and ed tech is how education is offered today. And especially given this new shift to online learning and a new reliance on ed tech. So attendance monitoring systems are actually a really strong example of how ed tech can promote data valence because it links attendance data with other fluid data from uh, learning management systems that provide information on levels of engagement, which are made available to the UKBI. 
Now the term engagement is often quite vague, but used a lot when describing how data is processed. And it can mean anything from participating to submitting an assignment, whether it's graded or not, sitting for exams and meeting with tutors. So on the bottom, um, I have a, a little example from Edinburgh's tier four student attendance and engagement policy, which calculates engagement points. So low engagement then can be used as a legitimate reason to suspend a tier four visa or even deport students. And for international students, this type of data capture can have really significant impacts. Um, and now it's unclear if other fluid data available from learning management systems are being used to determine engagement levels, particularly now that everything has moved online. Um, but I was really happy to see last year a lot of examples of resistance against this during the UCU strikes especially given that this type of monitoring is arguably an extension of the hostile environment policy, which specifically targets certain international students. Um, but I will say, to my knowledge at least, Edinburgh doesn't use too many attendance monitoring ed tech. Everything is just through the computer system where the lecturer says, yes, the student is here and no, they're not. And amazingly, that's one of the better options because at other universities, there are specific technologies that actually automate attendance monitoring. And this can be through swipe cards and sometimes even GPS trackers that students have to purchase and must carry with them at all times. And so that is particularly problematic as that type of surveillance becomes really embedded into the student experience. So what are some possible solutions to this? I don't have all of the answers, but I do have three things which I think might help make a positive step in the right direction, especially if the goal is to provide students one day with truly informed consent or at least draw more attention to this issue. And so the first idea is to incorporate mandatory briefing presentations on the extent of data capture and analysis in the university. And this would be um, basically going over the data privacy statement and legalities for processing data. As a former student, I can tell you, <laughs> I did not casually look up this information on my own and read all of these long documents. Um, and I don't think most students are doing that. So I don't think it's common knowledge what the data processing uh, statement and legal proceedings are for students. So I think by giving presentations, it would at least be a little bit more engaging than signing like a terms and agreement or assuming students will read these documents on their own. And this could be done during orientation week or the start of you know like week one or two to refresh everyone's memory and inform new students about what type of data processing is happening at the university. And the second idea I have is offering students the ability to consent to data collection for statistical and administrative purposes, but dissent from any analytics if that's their choice. And this can't happen overnight um, because it would require reconfiguring data collection and storage from a technical standpoint, but it's arguably a worthwhile cause because it would allow for all of the statistically, statistically necessitated data to be collected as well as legitimate interest data and analytics, but from informed and consenting students. And the third would be to offer genuine alternatives to data capture for courses that require using specific ed tech or analytics outside of the mandated use of something like Blackboard or Turnitin. And other options in this case, if you are a lecturer or you have some sort of say, I think other options should be presented so that students can complete their work without penalty, or at least spend a lot of time going over how their data is being collected, why this technology is ne necessary uh, for the assignment and for completing the course. And so to wrap up, students today are really growing up with data being collected and analyzed around them almost since birth for their entire life. And it's become such a natural and expected part of navigating life, like navigating privacy calculus of, do I give up data and privacy concerns to download TikTok or be active on Facebook or do I not? <laughs> and so why is data capture in the university any different than that? Especially if students are becoming used to data capture in other aspects of their life, why do we have to remain critical of the university? Studies have found that students have an overwhelming inherent trust in universities, um, especially when regarding the ethical and appropriate use of their data. And this level of trust even outweighs general privacy concerns. And this phenomenon is called dataism, which is the belief that users can trust their data safely to large corporations, or in this case, to the university. And the problem with dataism is ultimately it thrives on the assumption that data collection is happening naturally and data analysis is occurring without any present purpose, but just for the sake of accumulating knowledge. 
And this dataism can be very easily exploited by anyone looking to profit off of an obvious marketplace for student information. And so the potential for exploiting student data here is one incredibly important reason why we must remain vigilant and critique these data capture practices in the university, because ultimately we want to pr protect students and their data rights while they're pursuing higher education, because students should not be subjected to data valence or extreme data processing just in order to receive a degree. So with an increased interest and reliance on EdTech now, I would really urge you to continue asking these questions about consent um, and open up conversations with your students and colleagues about this and see what they have to say, because ultimately today it's impossible to attend university without participating in this vast amount of data collection, processing and analysis. So it's something that I think we have to be really um, vigilant about. So thank you. And I'll, I guess I'll take questions. Hey, uh, thanks so much, Mercedes. What a wonderful presentation with what, what horrible things <laughs> Maybe as well. Uh, and um, amazing visuals as well. So <laughs> very engaging. Um, yes, we are. We will have some questions, but we we will have a little break if that's okay, because we 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 are trying to make this uh, events kind of accessible, and and we kind of know that if uh, they take longer than an hour, uh, we have to have a break for um, accessibility reasons. So we'll have ten minutes break. Okay, and we will stop the recording as well, and we will come back to, to have our discussion. Okay, so it is nine minutes past six. Uh, we will start again at 20 past six, and we can think of really good questions in the meantime. Okay, all right, thank you.